What's up, everybody? I am Tasman, and this is the Bad at Halo show. Currently live on Mixer, Twitch, and YouTube. Out of Studio 77 here in New Phoenix. BM Win is in the chat. What's going on? JJ Juicebox with the host. Thanks for joining me tonight, guys. And trying to pull up everything at once. I've got the one monitor on my desk that you guys can see. And trying to squeeze all of this stuff onto one tiny little screen. Oh, a little bit of pregame lobby before we get up and going. Did get a little bit of Halo in this week. A little bit in with the Drunken Halo crew. A little bit in with the Podtacular crew as well. It was a lot of fun. And uh, caught a little bit of the Drunken Halo gold rank. And I'll put gold in quotes. Their gold rank free-for-all tournament. Um, let's see. What do we got here for results? Um, congratulations to all the sweaty tryhards that went into the gold ranked free for all as all of them who were uh platinum or above made it to the grand finals. And uh Travis Bryce, the former co-host of Drunken Halo, uh taking the title of champion and king teabagger in the free for all. Uh, however, there was an actual true uh, gold level final with all of the actual gold level players of the tournament getting together. Uh, and that uh, true gold free for all crown went to Bad at Halo Show, a Discord member, T Lock. So a huge congratulations to T Lock, who not only put the tournament together, but then goes out and wins. So, round of applause from the audience that is not here. T lock. Uh, and really that's that's about it. Um oh yeah, uh, one more thing at the uh free for all tournament. We did have a uh, friend of the show and every now and then uh comes on and helps me out with some stuff. Uh Dead Eye Viper, fellow Spartan dad, uh was trying to go out and carry the flag for the show, but like a true member of the Bad at Halo show community, he had technical issues. Uh, which prevented him from being able to participate. Uh, so you are definitely uh, quite the example and representative of the Bad at Halo show. Apparently he had to do like an Xbox update, like right during the time his heat was going. So unfortunate for him, uh, unfortunate uh, for T-Lock that he was only able to win in the true gold level final. Uh, but a lot of fun to watch. Uh, Mudcat over on Twitch uh, casted. Uh, along with a buddy of his. So a uh, very entertaining uh, casting group from Brian and Mudcat. So appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's really all that's it as far as Halo lies. Um, but uh, we got some stuff to talk about this week. We have the uh, Latin American Regional Qualifier took place uh, this past weekend, actually concluded today. So we've uh, we've got that. We actually had a North American 2K tournament on Saturday that nobody knew about. And uh, according to the size of the bracket, not a lot of people signed up for. So we'll kind of look at that a little bit. Um, we got a new loot crate. So the, the kit review for this month will be the new loot crate that came out. So i uh, warning you guys right now for anybody uh, that has your loot crate, but it's on the way, you don't have it yet. You don't want any spoilers. Uh, go ahead and uh, skip past that part and then come on back after you get it. But uh, we'll go through the loot crate and I've got a return of the running riot. So, and I think uh, it's like the first or second one, maybe the second one of the year. So a return of the running riot. So uh, we've got quite a bit of stuff to do. So let's go ahead. Let's transition, spawn in and get this started. Data drop number 77. Latin American region wrap up starts right now. On the line, Spartan. Game starts in three, two, one. 
Alrighty. So I go from my uh, typed out notes on the laptop to my handwritten notes from this past weekend's Latin American Regional Qualifier. Um, I tried desperately to find a copy of the bracket to show. And uh, for the life of me, I could not find one. And I'll try one last time here, live, <clears throat> because that's great radio. And I stopped to try to find stuff online. Um, but this kind of goes into some of the other production stuff, some of the other problems that I have with these regional qualifiers is that it is like pulling teeth to find brackets for these things. And they'll show brackets during the event itself, which is, is fine and good, but they're only showing you what they want you to see. So they'll only show specific sections of the bracket. It's like, no, give me, I want to see the entire bracket. And uh, so it's really tough to find here, uh, the brackets as far as who did what. Uh, so really what I could do is go over the games that actually took place on stream. And of course they are also on demand too. So you guys will be able to see uh, the rebroadcast online on the Halo YouTube channel, on the Halo Mixer channel. Uh, if you really want to check those out, let me see. Tournaments. Oh yeah, no. But this is this is kind of what I'm talking about. This is, I can't find a bracket to save my life. So I'll try one more time. But there weren't a lot of teams showing up. I think I was. I would say it would be on par with. Um, the Australian New Zealand regional, maybe a, actually a few more teams showed up. It was a little bit of a larger area. They had teams from Mexico and teams from Colombia, which really uh, rounded out the South American contingent. Um, yeah, great. Nice gaps in here. We'll see if Gamepedia's got one for us. Nope. All right. Yep, it didn't show last year. Fantastic. All right, well, I apologize for the big gap and uh, dead air in there. But uh, we had the, the region took place this past weekend. You had your top team coming in was actually a team from Colombia. The number one seed being uh, Colombian Legends. Number two, uh, Psychotic Gaming, who you guys may know in the past as being top of the world. And number three was Ultra Instinct out of Mexico and Infinity Gaming also out of Mexico. So three of the top four teams from Mexico competing this past weekend along with a bunch of other teams. Uh, your first game on stream on Saturday was a team called Terror Soldiers and Dogma BR. I will say this. The, the Latin American region has some of the best logos for teams that I've seen. Uh, most teams had a logo. Uh, there was very few that did not. Ironically enough, the number of teams Colombian, <laughs> Colombian Latins did not. Uh, but it was something you noticed. Okay. And in this first uh, game stream, you also have a player from the Latin American soldiers. Uh, the soldiers actually won this uh, series on stream three to none. Your bell made your uh, presence known and often actually in this one. Capture the flag, she gets the winning flag cap. Um, and honestly, I. I had a, a, a point where they had they were a sliver just that much from being able to return the flag and counter cap uh, be able to to pull off uh, possibly get back into it and, and reverse and win on truth but unfortunately uh, Pinkerbell and crew 
came up clutch late with a late camo grab. Uh, excuse me, late uh, with the uh, with the touch to keep the lightning in play and score in the winning cap. Uh, and then when uh, a close rig slayer game, a close plot of the game. Um, so Terra Soldiers and Dogma was actually a good one to get started. Um, um, but then we've got uh, really, I, I, I think the weekend and, and probably the focus of the recap would be on the top four teams. And one of those top four teams was uh, Psychotic Gaming. And their first game on stream was against Hit Saren Gaming, uh, a team that per, uh, had another uh, female gamer on them in uh, Sakura. Uh, but Psychotic Gaming, you've got Pelu, Zeldun, Atzo, and Drift. Uh, this is the Shock the World team that represented the Latin American region during last year's finals. And they... Uh, absolutely steamrolled this hit Saren team. Uh, Truth captured the flag, uh, three caps to one. Rig Slayer fifty to thirty-three, uh, and Plaza Strongholds one hundred to twenty-three. Uh, that last Plaza Strongholds game, there was a really strong start uh, by that HIT uh, Saren hit Saren team. They actually went out on a twenty-three-zero run. But after that 23 points, it was all psychotic gaming after that. Zelda going 13 and 7. Uh, the Rig Slayer, uh, Pelu made his uh, presence felt went going 15 and 7 with uh, Sakura on uh, Hit Saren, the only HS player in the positive. Uh, and even then, she was 10 and 11, and it was her assist that uh, put her back into the positive. Um, and then Psychotic Truth captured the flag in that 3-1. to one. Uh, hit, hit Saren, struck first, got the first cap. But after that, it was all Psychotic Gaming. Zeldin, again, making his mark felt 15-7 and seven with Sakura for Hit Saren being the only player to hit double digits and kills with 10. So Psychotic Gaming setting the stage early for what was going to be a very dominant weekend for them. Uh in this regional qualifier. Uh, the next one was a very interesting matchup in that uh, these two teams that faced each other were the actual rematch of the last 2K Grand Finals for the Mexican region. So you have Ultra Instinct, Dulatot, Gambino, Critical God or Critical Warrior, and then you have Noble taking the place of Tapping Buttons. Tapping Buttons will be competing uh, this upcoming weekend in Columbus uh, for the North America qualifier spot. You have them taking on Infinity Gaming of Nugget, Bullet, Zaron, and Elio. And uh, this one went... Doo -doo -doo -doo. One, two, three, four. This one went uh, all five. With Empire Strongholds going to uh, Ultra Instinct 100 to 96. Uh, Infinite or Infinity Gaming had a 35 point lead, but Ultra Instinct was able to get back in the game despite uh, IG having almost constant power up and power weapon control, and came down to a massive pit fight at the end. And uh, Ultra Instinct <coughs> uh, was just or uh, just a hair away from actually turning it over uh, again. This one kind of came down to. That, that either that return or that cap when you're just, just there, like just a hair away from getting that flip back over. Uh, UI was able to hold on and win for that 196. You had a regret slayer 50 to 39 in favor of Infinity Gaming. Zoran with no ammo, no ammo, no grenades, nothing. He gets a ground pound kill on one of the Ultra Instinct players, takes his ammo, and keeps on going. So a huge, huge, huge play from Zoran. And that was kind of his story throughout the weekend. Really kind of stepped up uh, to show uh, the world on stream what he could do as part of that Infinity Gaming squad. Uh, each team had a massive overshield misplay in this game in that they, they would get the overshield, they'd 
clinch it into their chest and then immediately would get assassinated got some sort of back whack something happened in there uh so that happened once for each team and it's really demoralizing and depressing seeing a spartan with the green overshield on the ground dead so um each team kind of had a mistake in there we then moved on to Coliseum, captured the flag with Infinity Gaming, taking that three caps to none. And while <clears throat> while it looked, it, it didn't look close in the score, it looked close watching the game. There was definitely a lot of back and forth, a lot of seesaws, a lot of flag runs that didn't quite work out for Ultra Instinct. Um, Infinite, uh, Infinity Gaming actually had a couple of flag misplays that could have ended this game far, far earlier than it actually did. And then we got uh, Walsh with uh, the Juggle Flub comment, which then came out in the broadcast all weekend. It ended up being one of the codes to get a free rec pack at one point. The Juggle Flub is now a thing. Uh, Infinity Gaming's Nugget going 24-17 and 17 in this Coliseum Capture the Flag game. He was definitely keeping Ultra Instinct back and on their heels during this game uh so infinity gaming is up two games to one we then go into eden strongholds with infinity or ultra instinct getting a big rebound in a very dominating 100 to 15 win nobody on infinity gaming hit double digits and kills in this game this game was all ultra instinct all the time and they rolled that momentum right into plaza slayer with a 50 to 29 victory they avoid the elimination bracket they are owed a steak dinner uh with that one uh infinity gaming uh finds themselves in the elimination bracket far earlier than i think they were anticipating and in the elimination bracket so we'll make a make a jump down to the uh, elimination bracket we've got natural killers from all accounts from the casters, really nice guys, these natural killers. Uh, they kept saying that over and over again. Uh, natural killers, you have Angel, Yuki, Johan, Master, and Julitho. And you have Infinity Gaming, or excuse me, Immunity Gaming, not Infinity Gaming. Uh, Immunity Gaming is Danny Master, Flamebot, Gera, and Legolas. Uh, this was all natural killers. Fathom capture the flag three to nothing. Rig Slayer fifty to thirty. Another steak dinner and Plaza Strongholds one hundred to thirty three. Natural killers might be nice guys, but Immunity Gaming, uh, they were not nice to at all. And this was kind of the tone out of the entire weekend as far as as games were going. Um, a lot of sweeps a lot of dominating victories not always by the team you would expect to be dominating um but it just seems like the games that they were showing on stream that's kind of how it was going um a lot of a lot of sweeps a lot of uh just absolute dominant gameplay one team just really being set back on their heels and not really getting uh, an opportunity to come back into it the Ultra Instinct Infinity Gaming, I think on Saturday, was the only series that really went back and forth like that. Uh, as we see here, again, we get Psychotic Gaming for their second uh, game on stream on Saturday versus Legion Raccoon. Legion Raccoon is Chico, Ram, Reaper, and Zeus. Uh, we have a Fathom Capture the Flag Psychotic Gaming, two caps to one, so time did run out. Pelu from Psychotic Gaming, a 30 bomb in kills. And Atzo has had 4,009 damage. Uh, and then all but Chico were above 3,000 damage. So all seven other players except for Chico, 3,000 or more damage in this game. And again, a 2-1 victory for Psychotic Gaming, letting time expire. Rig Slayer, Psychotic Gaming... A lot of stakes being served Saturday night in Mexico City. They win 50 to 29. Zeldin for Psychotic Gaming going 15 and 7. Uh, on the other side, on the flip side for Legion Raccoon, Reaper and Zeus not helping out the cause. Both going 7 and 13. You can't do that and avoid the stake in pro play. Psychotic Gaming then closes it out. Plaza Strongholds <laughs> 100. To nothing. What are you gonna say about that? 
And it's just absolute whitewashing. A uh, goose, I think one or two players on Legion Raccoon were on goose alert as far as kills for the entire game. I think they finally got a couple at the end. Um, Psychotic Gaming completely dominant in this series. And then your last game for Saturday was Colombian Legends, the number one seed. Uh, and we get to see Ultra Instinct once again. Colombian Legends, number one seed, the team, or the players for them, Hayes, Tolkien, Guardian, and Pablo. Uh, and this was an absolute whitewashing, but not in the way that anybody expected. We've got Fathom, Capture the Flag, Ultra Instinct wins two to nothing. Uh, Ultra Instinct completely controlled the power ups and power weapons, getting that camo rail gun combo that you love to see to keep control of top mid. Uh, Noble on Ultra Instinct, 29 kills, but unfortunately matched that with 21 deaths. So uh, only a plus eight there. Critical Warrior, Critical God, and Dulatot with 24 kills and only 13 deaths. So they were uh, definitely carrying the mail for Ultra Instinct there. We move on to Rig Slayer. Uh, Ultra Instinct pulls out a close 50-45 to 45 victory there. Critical God going 16-10. and 10. Guardian over on Colombian Legends 8-12. and 12. Uh, and three players, he is one of the three players for Colombian Legends that went negative in this game. So the number one seed having a really, really rough start on Saturday night. Plaza Strongholds then went also went to Ultra Instinct 100 to 37. Noble again stepping into the shoes for tapping buttons and doing so very well, going 22 and 9. Ultra Instinct very aggressive in this game, forcing long trip caps. Completely just collapsing anytime Columbia Legends was trying to just get one of those strongholds to stop the bleeding. Ultra Instinct was all over them, almost from every route you could possibly take. And the number one seed drops 0-3 and into the elimination bracket on Saturday night. Uh, a few things about the broadcast on Saturday before we go over Championship Sunday. Um... Broadcast was rough. Uh, let's just let's just say that. And I got my my notes here, and not that I necessarily need them. Um, but we first started off with a two-hour delay in the morning with no explanation given as to why. Uh, it was uh, advertised to be starting at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. That is 8 a.m. where I am. I got on at about. 9.45, and it still hadn't started yet. Uh, and then I think they went through about four countdown timers, getting to zero and resetting before they finally came in. Um, when they came in, uh, they were having extreme amount of problems with the caster audio to start. We had another extended long break after that first game of Terrace Soldiers and Dogma. Uh, and then also from game two on for most of the rest of Saturday, the game cams were off. So unlike London, unlike Australia, uh, we actually had face cams uh, to match with the player station, which was, was nice. I mean, I, it, it is a nice added feature. You know, it's nice to put kind of faces with the names and kind of see their intensity, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and, and just, it, it, it kind of adds that extra dimension. Um, so that's nice to have. Uh, I'm not saying that it's not, but uh, they couldn't get the cams uh, right. They couldn't get the overlay to match which player was at which station. Uh, and uh, I think at some point after that second game, they just completely gave up on it, and it was all spectator mode the rest of Saturday. Um, and then so the rest is kind of stuff that, that took place on, on Sunday as well, and I'll kind of go into some of my overall feelings about the broadcast, but Saturday was tough. It was a very tough broadcast. Um, just lots of long delays, lots of issues trying to hear the casters, a lot of static um definitely uh something that the production squad needed to rebound on championship sunday much like 
some of these other teams. So on Championship Sunday, you have the teams left standing are Infinity Gaming, Legion Raccoon, uh, Colombian Legends, uh, Psychotic Gaming, and Ultra Instinct. So your, your top five ranked teams are the ones left standing for Championship Sunday, as you would probably expect in this type of tournament. Our very first game on stream is Infinity Gaming versus Legion Raccoon for an elimination game. And, and Legion Raccoon has to forfeit the first map because a player was late. Uh, how are you late for an elimination game? I, I don't know how he was getting to the venue. You know, was he not feeling good? Did his car break down? Was the bus late? You've got to make sure you are there because you're already now putting your team behind the eight ball against a team in Infinity Gaming that is very, very good. Goes Went toe-to-toe -to -toe with a team like Ultra Instincts. You can't be giving yourself a handicap on the first match of the day, the first stream of the day, and uh, Legion Raccoon goes down one. They forfeit Truth Capture the Flag. Uh, and then after that, Infinity Gaming is rolling. Obviously, they're rolling. They're warmed up. They're ready to work as a team. They take Coliseum Slayer 50-41. to 41. I'm surprised it's as close as it was, considering uh, the late start that Legion Raccoon was getting. And then Plaza Strongholds 100 to 16. Infinity Gaming takes that, sweeps Legion Raccoon right out of the tournament. And if I'm the rest of the players on Legion Raccoon, I am probably getting rid of that fourth player who showed up late right away, finding somebody else to take that spot who's a little bit more dependable. Uh, you can't do that. You cannot put your team that far behind on an elimination game on Championship Sunday when you're fighting for your share of $25,000 and a world final spot. Uh, just to me, that's unacceptable. And if I'm somebody on that team, I am super pissed off. Next game on stream was your winner bracket uh, finals. It was Psychotic Gaming versus Ultra Instinct. A lot of hype built up for this game. You have your two strongest teams in the region throughout uh, all of Saturday. So um psychotic gaming goes through and they tell ultra instinct what is up they take rig strongholds 100 to 58 drift from psychotic gaming goes 15 and 5 uh unfortunately on the other side for ultra instinct critic god goes only on 9 and 15 plaza slayer psychotic gaming takes that one in a very very close 50 to 48 Drift again, showing his slaying prowess, going 14 and 8. Uh, and uh, Critigod had a rebound game in this one, going 20 and 14, uh, helping his team stay right there with Psychotic Gaming all the way to the end. Uh, and even did a late game push to make it even closer uh, and potentially could have turned some of the fortunes around. Uh, unfortunately for them, we have Psychotic Gaming winning Truth Capture the Flag, three caps to two. Uh, Ultra Instinct actually up two to one in this game. However, uh, Psychotic Gaming answers with two very quick caps to end the game. I believe when they capped number two, they were already running number three. So they had that last two up and ready to go. 166 total slays between both teams in this game. So uh, I noticed that quite a bit. This weekend, um, a lot of these players, a lot of these teams are really prioritizing the slaying, especially in objective game types, whereas in North America, sometimes you will see teams get ridiculously outslayed but still win the objective. Um, very uh, objective efficient in North America. In the Latin American region, it looks like they really just kind of go for outslaying the other team, trying to keep them on spawn and winning the objective that way. And in this case, that worked out for Psychotic Gaming. And then Eden Strongholds, Psychotic Gaming uh, dominates this one. I believe it was 100 to 34. I did not write the final score down, but I do believe that's what it was. You've got uh, 
psychotic gaming then moving on i do believe that qualified them for the grand finals yep okay so infinity gaming moving on to the grand finals or uh, excuse me psychotic gaming moving on to the grand finals with that loss infinity gaming then goes up against colombian legends so infinity gaming has to rebound rather quickly they are back on main stage right away and uh decide to put this away right away they win fathom capture the flag three to nothing they go on and win the rig slayer 50 to 42 zaron 19 and 9 uh showing his slaying power once again uh pablo from colombian legends falters going only 6 and 12 uh infinity gaming then rolls into plaza strongholds with a 100 to 11 complete domination of the number one seed nugget from infinity gaming going 15 and 6 and zoran making his presence felt in the slang once again 14 and 7 colombian legends never looked like the number one team or the number one seed that they were in throughout their entire games being streamed like they rolled through some of the lower teams but as soon as they ran into a team like Ultra Instinct, as soon as they ran into a team uh, like Psychotic Gaming, Infinity Gaming, they looked completely lost. And uh, they go home, I believe, in fourth place. Uh, so they do take home a little bit of cash money. Uh, $2,500 for Colombian Legends, but it has got to be an extreme disappointment for that team only coming out uh, with a fourth place victory or with a fourth place standing, not even a victory. Uh, so that then puts infinity gaming up against ultra instinct. The winner of this series going on to face psychotic gaming for first place and for the one and only Latin American region spot uh, for worlds and you've got Infinity Gaming Ultra Instinct, the rematch that in the previous series went five. This one didn't take near as many. Infinity Gaming really finding their stride. They take Empire Strongholds 100 to 57. Bullet from Infinity Gaming going 16 and 11. Whilst on the uh, Ultra Instinct side, Dulatot kind of carrying or weighing his team down, only going 8 and 15. Excuse me, 8 and 15. Regret Slayer up next. You have Infinity Gaming taking this one 50 to 38. Elio, his name seemed to come up a lot during this particular game. He was cleaning up kills left and right, and uh, he decided to become the Latin American uh, tactical crouching champion as he was doing body disrespect to, I believe, all four players of Ultra Instinct got themselves some tactical crouch courtesy of Elio in this game. Uh, Ultra Instinct would get some revenge in Colosseum capture the flag with a 3-2 victory. Uh, they had the early two-cap lead. Infinity Gaming comes storming back uh, and tries <laughs> and ties the game despite an absolute god rocket from Ultra Instinct's Noble, killing all but one player. That one player able to return the flag that was grabbed and then grab Ultra Instinct's flag, and score the cap. So, uh, <laughs> And I believe he got Noble with a ground pound, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so Noble did what he could do. Uh, unfortunately for him, at that point, uh, not able to make the save. Uh, but Ultra Instinct does end up going on to win this, uh, this game. Uh, Critigod with Ultra Instinct, 25 kills, only 15 deaths. Uh, to help Ultra Instinct rebound and really get back into the series. Uh, but it would be short-lived. Plaza Strongholds Infinity Gaming wins 100-21. to um, Dominating, an absolute dominating performance. And uh, Zoran going 16-10. and Critigod, uh, after having such a great Coliseum Capture the Flag game, had a really bad game in this one, only going 6-13. and um, and it seemed like maybe they kind of ran out of gas because in true Slayer, Infinity Gaming takes the series 50 to 42. Uh, 
They draw uh, uh, Infinity Gaming goes out to a huge 15 kill lead at the beginning. Uh, Ultra Instinct tried the late game comeback, but it was just a little too little too late. Um, it, it seemed like they got a hold of what they were supposed to do with camo um, at the end of the game. They were able to control camo, but they would seem to either burn it or they would expose their location a little too early uh, and would get melted um, before they could get full use out of it. They finally seemed to figure it out late, but by then, uh, like I said, too little too late. And Infinity Gaming, the number three seed team, kind of pulls the upset against Ultra Instinct. Ultra Instinct goes home in third place. $4,000 for them. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the absence of tapping buttons from this roster was definitely felt. Noble did the best, I think, that he could have been asked to do. Um, but I think when you're missing a key player, and especially one at the level that tapping buttons is at, um, th that really does hurt. So Ultra Instinct your third place team. So we have our grand finals of Psychotic Gaming versus Infinity Gaming. And Infinity Gaming comes out strong on Coliseum Capture the Flag. They draw first blood with the first flag cap. Um, really kind of putting Psychotic Gaming on their heels in a way that we hadn't seen all weekend. Uh, Infinity Gaming later performs a counter cap. Uh, able to kill the psychotic player in blue or in the blue base who was just again a sliver <laughs> these games some of these games some of these caps uh, some of these returns have come down to just that just that little bit of a hair um, but they were able to stop the return at the last second get a touch uh, and be able to get that second cap uh, unfortunately um, that was all that we were going to see from there as Ultra or uh, Psychotic Gaming would then find their legs. Zeldin runs a second cap all on his own from coast to coast. Uh, and then uh, it, it seemed like they had another flag cap running immediately behind him to get that number three, uh, running it through the, through the map like a madman, secure the game one victory on Coliseum, capture the flag three to two. We then move on to Riggs Slayer where Psychotic Gaming again storms out to a 10-kill lead with camo and power weapon control. Atzo dominating and making sure every single opponent knew it. Um, Psychotic ends up winning 50-32. to Zoran again with his slaying power, helping to avoid the steak dinner uh, with 12 kills, but all four Infinity Gaming players, including Zoran, do finish in the negative. And again, on Grand Finals, on Main Stage, you can't be finishing in the negative if you expect to take home victories. And Atzo was doing his best Elio, just absolutely body disrespecting anybody and anybody. If there was a dead body on the floor, they might have respawned two minutes ago. He was still teabagging him. He was letting everybody from Infinity Gaming know that he was the man out on the map. We then go to a Plaza Stronghold. Psychotic continues the domination with a 100-54 victory, playing super aggressive. And uh, Lestat, who's one of the Spanish broadcasters for the region, who uh, jumped in on main stage and the, uh, the English-speaking cast uh, for this series, he was even talking about how they weren't basing their player on the camo like most, most teams do. You'll see these lulls and sometimes these slowdowns and almost stops of play while teams and players kind of get set up to make a rush for the power-up. Psychotic Gaming wasn't doing this. They didn't care about the camo. To a point, they didn't care if the other team picked it up. They were relying strictly on their, excuse me, on their slaying power. And it was working and it was effective because uh, they're, they were definitely relying on their superior shots to keep Infinity Gaming on their heels, then they did absolutely that with that 100-54 to victory. Game 4 would be a Fathom Capture the Flag with Psychotic Gaming getting two flag caps so early. If you blinked, you missed them. Because, again, they just did... It was almost like a relay race where they were getting these flags and then they would cap it. And then the next one was already being pushed out the window and out through subs. So they were uh, they definitely had their relay race on 
Uh, they were looking for number three and to end it uh, very, very quickly. Uh, but Infinity Gaming's Bullet did a clutch uh, pull right through the window at the end. And some coordinated teamwork for the flag return brought it back to two to one. Uh, Palo? Palo? Yeah, Palo. Palo from Psychotic Gaming gets rail and camo at the mid game. He maintains that control of top mid. They completely slay out Infinity Gaming to get the third cap, complete the sweep, and Psychotic Gaming is your Latin American region champions, and they will be representing the Latin American region at finals in Seattle in April. Infinity Gaming, for their efforts, they come home with second place and $6,000, while Psychotic Gaming gets the big check from Ed Tashi McMahon uh, for $10,000. Uh, and again, that spot at Worlds. So Psychotic Gaming again is Atso, Drift, Pelu, and Zeldin. So we will be seeing them in Seattle. Um, a couple of things about just personal observations from the stream. I talked about the stream and the stream issues they continued again on Sunday, albeit lesser. Uh, still issues with audio. Um, however, uh, for the most part, many of the delays seem to have been taken care of. They were able to fix that. Um, so that was good. Um, one of the other issues that, that they seemed to have, especially on Saturday, was letting the casters know what match was not only being broadcast, but where it was in the bracket. Were they doing elimination bracket? Were they doing the winner's bracket? What round of the bracket was it? Um, a lot of times they really seemed lost and not really know what was going on. And that's production, letting the casters know, feeding them that information so that they actually sound like they know what they're talking about. Um, again, I think that was more Saturday than Sunday. Sunday was a lot easier being there was only five teams left. So um, The stage for uh, Latin American Regional actually looked really cool. Um, unfortunately the venue, when, when they first showed the wide shot of the venue, um, the first thing that I thought was your Latin American regional being presented in the local high school gymnasium. Um, it definitely looked a little bit, a little low key. Uh, it, it, it really did. It looked like a gymnasium with a bunch of fold out chairs, uh, for the audience. Um, but the stage, the stage was really cool and it was really unique. Uh, it was elevated, and it had some nice LED uh, lights on the front for the, the Halo World Championship logos and stuff like that. They had the two, the two stations for the two teams, and they were kind of off at an angle. And then in front of each of the players, they had a player cam for each of them. So whether if the player cam wasn't working, at least on the stream, at least you could see it in the audience where they had each of the player cams in front of them. And then uh, they had this really odd looking like halo. It was spelled out halo in the middle of the stage and it was standing on, on some sort of, uh, of base, but it, it, it kind of looked like, I, I don't know if it was like, it almost looked like tinfoil. Um, but it was kind of cool because when the light hit it, it, it did these like really cool uh, like lens flare effects that it looked really it looked really cool when the lights were on it but when everything was pulled away it just kind of looked like halo and tin foil or aluminum foil since there hasn't been tin foil since the 50s um but anyway that was interesting um but the thing that i really liked was two things really and the first one was on the back of the stage they had this big master chief helmet and out of the master chief helmet right where his mouth is was a cutout, and that's where the players would walk out to go to their station. Um, but the really cool thing about this is that the, the chief helmet itself was, was plain white, and they had this projector that would project different images onto the helmet. So it would project like the lines for the helmet. Um, it would go through different color schemes. It would project, uh, I think I saw at one point, I saw explosions on there. And then the visor, was a completely separate projector on its own. And it kind of had this, it would have the team logos. So you would have like Terra Soldiers and Dogma Gaming, and then it would have like a diagonal cut. And so that way you'd see 
Okay, Terra Soldiers is red. Dogma Gaming is blue. And it, it looked, it just, it looked very cool in it. It was something I hadn't seen at any of these other events before. So I thought it was very interesting, very unique uh, part of the stage. Um, and then they had this massive um, LED screen kind of hanging. It was hanging from the ceiling and it looked like it was like right at where the front of the stage was. And so that way people that were sitting, they could look up and watch what was going on on the stream and then you know be able to watch all the players and their reactions. So uh, the stage itself, uh, while the venue seemed like it was a little low key, uh, the stage itself looked really, really cool. So I think they did a great job as far as um, their stage and what they put together. Um, the players themselves, especially on Championship Sunday, seemed a little too, a little too low key for me. Um, I made a comment in the Discord when somebody was asking. I think Sniper D in the Discord was was asking about how the event was going, and I made a comment that these kids looked like they were playing multiplayer matchmaking in their living room and not like they were on main stage for a world's qualifier playing for a piece of $25,000. Like there was, there was no hooting. There was no hollering. There was no trash talking until the very end. There got to be some, but it was like a game and series was over and you know, there they are like, you know, they're, they're sitting here, they're on their phone. They're like, da, 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 da. Or, you know, they're wrapping their stuff up. There's no, there's no fist bumps. There's no standing up. And there's no cheering. There's no talking trash to the other team. It's like, guys, have some intensity. <laughs> You're playing for a lot of money and a spot at Worlds to potentially get a lot more money. Um, have some enthusiasm. Have some drive. Have some fire. Um, again, on Championship Sunday, when you got to your last three teams, you got a little bit more of that. Um, but really just a, as a spectator, as somebody watching it on stream, is like watching somebody just kind of being like, eh, okay, we just won. It's, just, it's really just kind of off-putting. Um, so I would have liked to have seen a lot more intensity from the players. Uh, the casting group did a great job. Uh, we had Golden Boy, Bravo, Walshy, uh, Clutch and uh, Unishek was there for one as well. And then, like I said, Lestat from uh, Mexico, who normally does the uh, casting for the 2Ks, jumped in for the grand finals and, and did some casting with Bravo and Golden Boy. So that was really cool. They all did a great job. Uh, you could tell they were having a lot of fun, uh, especially when uh, at the end of a match, when they're going through the highlights and the audio guys forget to kill their mics. And so you're hearing Golden Boy, Bravo, and Walshy. Um, you're, you're hearing them kind of critique their casting, which was, you know, it was kind of a, a, an interesting look into, you know, how they even, you know, look at themselves, say, hey, this was really good. I think we could have done this better. Um, so you're, you're kind of getting a little bit of a behind the, the curtains peek at casting. So that was kind of cool. Um, but again, kind of goes back into the, the overall production uh, of the event, especially the audio. But uh, with that, guys, congratulations to Psychotic Gaming. Uh, we'll be seeing them in Seattle. Uh, once again, though, no rest for the wicked as this upcoming weekend is the big one. MLG Columbus this coming weekend starts on Friday, ends on Sunday. Um, so we are going to have nine teams qualify from Columbus to go to Seattle to fill out the 16 team finals field. So um, with that guys, we actually had a 2k tournament on Saturday for North America and surprise, surprise splice wins it once again, this time beating team envious. Um, you can tell that teams are no longer really prioritizing the 2k ladders because this was probably one of the smallest brackets for a 2K. Um, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. I've got it on my phone. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. I think only 14. Um, so there you go. Normally we're getting 30s, 40s, 50s. We're down to less than 20. Um, so I think a lot of teams are kind of in the position of we are where we are. 
we are where we're going to be. Uh, and I do believe Columbus is an invitational. It is not an open like Orlando. So I think only a certain number of teams are going to even be allowed to compete at Columbus for those nine spots. But with nine spots open, that is a very wide open field. And considering the talent level that's currently in North America, I think we're going to get some teams uh, into finals where teams like Infused, Vexed, Mind Freak, uh, and Psychotic Gaming might actually be able to make a run and get a couple of victories and really make this a truly global competition. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, my money is still on Splice to come out as your world champions for 2018. But we will talk a little bit more about that next weekend. Um, but right now we are gonna transition because we have a loot crate to look at. All right. Oh, now you guys are a little more up close and personal for those of you guys that are watching live. Oh, we've got, uh, we got this loot crate that came in. I got mine on Thursday this past week. This is a loot crate number 10 total. I believe it's number four out of this series. Uh, yeah, number four out of series two, 10th crate overall. And this one was uh, themed, let's get tactical. So let's take a look at uh, some of the goodies that we got this month. And uh, do, 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 do. Oh, get out of studio mode. There we go. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to, I need to hire a producer. Anybody that wants to produce, put in your application, Bad Halo Show, or Bad Halo Gamer at yahoo.com. All right, guys. Um, I've done a couple of Loot Crate reviews before. Uh, the one thing I always seem to forget, and I forgot about it so much that I didn't even put a picture of it up uh, <laughs> on for the stream, but I will post it on Twitter. Um, I continuously forget about the box art. Like, we take a look at the box, and, and, and we get so excited about the things that are in the box that we completely forget that there's some pretty cool artwork inside the box and then you can actually unfold the box and make it like this giant poster um for this one uh is uh we we get some pretty cool uh artwork in here too this is no exception um halo isn't a series known for its boss fights but this final boss is very memorable uh, this month's bo uh, box art is adorned with our favorite Halo 2 Brute Batty Tartarus. And so there's a nice black and white uh, image of him holding his gravity hammer. Um, and again, very, very cool. And I'll post a picture of that on uh, the Bad at Halo Show Twitter account. Just something I always seem to forget about when uh, when I'm looking at the uh, the stuff that we get for the loot crate. All right. Let's start with the item that's usually a big deal for me, and that's our apparel item, and that's actually the item I'm wearing right now. I'm actually wearing our brand new Halo t-shirt, and this one is the Mark of Shame t-shirt. This month, we get ourselves a light gray t-shirt with a black screen print of the symbol known as the Mark of Shame. Branded to the Sanghili Thel Vadim at the start of Halo 2, just before he was offered the position of Arbiter. Uh, a little information on the Mark of Shame provided by the always informative group over at Halopedia. The Mark of Shame is a brand given to those who have either disgraced or turned away from the Covenant. The Mark of Shame is permanently imprinted onto the bare chest of the disgraced, being via a special branding iron. After receiving the mark, that being is executed soon thereafter out of sheer humility. The only known exception to this tradition was the Sangheli Thel of Adam, formerly the supreme commander in charge of protection of Installation 04, who, instead of being executed, was offered the position of arbiter by the hierarchs to atone for his sins. 
Ironically, during the Great Schism, the Mark of Shame became a rallying point or a rallying symbol of the Fleet of Retribution and a sign of the deference to Vadim's honor, often being worn by the rank and file Sangheili warriors. So with that, <laughs> I find it rather odd that 343 would choose to adorn some of their most hardcore uh, and loyal fans with the Mark of Shame, uh, even if the symbol has re uh, was redeemed as a sign of strength and unity. It is also uh, an emblem that you can choose for your uh, Spartan profile in Halo 2, 3, and Halo 3 ODST. Um, I also find it rather disappointing that in a crate that was marketed as having to do with Sergeant Avery Johnson as Let's Get Tactical is a line of dialogue from the Sergeant Major. Uh, I was expecting something a little more akin to Sergeant Johnson. Uh, I also find this to be a rather simple shirt. I could have bought a plain gray t-shirt myself, screen printed it, and uh, gotten it done probably for a little bit cheaper. So with that, guys, what rating I give our apparel item in this month's Loot Crate? On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being, hey, does that shirt still have the original fold creases? To a 10 being, oh my god, do you not have another shirt in your wardrobe? Uh, I unfortunately give this one a lowly rank of 2. So there you go. Uh, next up is what I would deem this crate's fun item. Uh, this go around, we get the rare double apparel crate, but I would also categorize, categorize these as the fun part of the crate as well. The Arbiter's Armored Feet Socks. So this addition to the loot crate is uh, from the company Odd Socks. We have a powder blue base sock with white, silver, and gray design for the top of your feet and shins that give you the look like you could walk around in the Arbiter's massive shoes. Um, and so this is kind of cool too because, you know, with these socks and how the pattern is put on them, you almost get that, uh, that kind of, and, and for those of you on stream, da, 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 you're going to see my awesome foot modeling career. Um, you kind of get that, uh, that same effect of, uh, of, uh, the elites with how their their legs kind of go backwards at the knee and it's kind of like their their ankles are a little bit higher and i'm holding up one of my mattel elites but like from the hip it kind of goes out and then you got the knee but then it bends all the way back and then the ankle seems to be up a little bit higher and so you kind of get where where it almost looks like on a human like it would be hyper extended or, or bending in the opposite direction We'll see if he's up on the I doubt it, but we'll try. Okay. But you kind of get that same effect with these socks. And so it almost kind of looks like you kind of have that same type of, of, uh, of thing going on with your feet. So it's, it's actually really, really cool. Um, I've been trying to find a pair of halo theme socks for a while. Uh, I do have a pair of red dress socks, but they're rather small and they cut off the circulation to my feet. Um, these, uh, however, are extremely comfortable and I'm going to get as much use out of them as I can before Mrs. Taz takes them because she has an affinity for goofy, silly, or otherwise just kind of themed type comfortable socks. And these things definitely fit that bill. Overall, I really dig the look of them. I do love how comfortable they are. They'll get lots of use. My downside to these is kind of the same as the shirt and that these feel a little bit out of place uh, in this particular loot crate. As again, I would have thought it would have been something Sergeant Johnson themed. Double sold OD green, which is a reference to Forrest Gump. Yes, I am old. So what rating to I give our fun slash second apparel item in this month's loot crate? So on a scale of one to 10, with one being, uh, maybe I can give these away to a kid at Christmas <laughs> for them to throw over their shoulder like Christmas Story. Again, an outdated reference. To a 10 being, how do I attach a soul to these and wear them as shoes? 
uh, I give this one a solid seven. So that's actually not bad. And I'm going to take my foot model uh, career off of the stream. Gosh, I missed my calling. All right, guys, so let's go from strength to strength here out of this crate. And let's take a look at this month's artwork that we got in the crate. Uh, and this one, da, I'll put uh, full, full up on the stream for you guys. Yeah, for the themed poster, uh, <clears throat> this themed poster has every Halo fan's favorite Sergeant Major front and setter staring stage right, charging up a Spartan laser and ready to release a beam of red death on some sorry Covenant bastard. Prominent in the background is Sergeant Major's friend and future executioner, 343 Guilty Spark, looking ominous, or, well, at least as ominous as a thing with no facial features can look at Sergeant Johnson. Both characters are encircled uh, by a halo ring, and an, I, I thought it was unfinished, but uh, by after closer inspection, um, it just kind of looks like the terrain, that's just kind of how the terrain was detailed on the inside of the arc. So there you go. Uh, a halo ring encircles the two of them. Uh, with a background of what appears to be a snowy a forerunner installation, complete with falling snowflakes throughout the work. Um, all right, back into here. And... Ah, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> Isaac Hannaford, who is the artist uh, for our Loot Crate artwork, uh, has at times uh, had artwork that's kind of hit or miss within these Loot Crates. I would categorize this one as a very a big hit um, is an absolutely stunning piece of artwork. My only downside to this piece, and it's a small, very, very minor gripe, not even a gripe, just minor, just um, observation that I would make with this is that the image, when I first saw it, it the image reminded me more of Halo 3 and, and the final mission of Halo 3. Uh, while the rest of the crate is Johnson slash Halo 2 themed. Um, but again, this is such a, a, a really minor detraction uh, from this really gorgeous piece of artwork. So where do I rank this month's artwork contribution? On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being suitable for fire kindling and 10 being someone clear a spot out of the Smithsonian, I am actually giving this one a 9. <laughs> A nine and the highest rated item out of this month's loot crate uh, was the artwork. I've actually already got it, and it's it's off uh, off camera here in Studio Seventy Seven. But I've actually already got it uh, framed and up on the wall in the Taz corner. So um, that's how much uh, I particularly liked this piece of artwork. So there we go. All right, and so we knew about the artwork that was coming in because that was part of the marketing campaign. So we also knew about this next item that was coming up because it too was part of the marketing campaign and that is our Halo Icons figure. This month's Icons figure is Sergeant Major Avery Johnson clad in his olive green and khaki battle gear complete with UNSC green cap and holding his signature Sweet Williams cigar. His trusty shotgun and crate of additional ammo is affixed to the Forerunner-themed base that comes with this series. And Sergeant Johnson isn't alone as he's casually leaning against his favorite floating light bulb, 343 Guilty Spark, with the still-friendly blue-faced light on him. Um, I feel like this is a great follow-up to the Master Chief Bubble Shield combo that we got in the last Loot Crate. Uh, while both figures are about the same base size, the Sergeant Johnson one is far more compact, making it far easier to have it on your desk, on your gaming setup, on your workspace. I mean, I'm, I've got a picture of it, but I'm also holding it up on camera as far as just being able to, you know, see. I mean, it's, he's, he's fairly compact onto that base. 
unlike the chief where the bubble shield kind of went out a little bit further from the base um, this one is, is definitely a little bit uh, easier to fit into a bit of a tighter spot. So uh, as, as somebody that has a lot of Halo themed stuff on my workspace, uh, it's nice to be able to uh, add something to it without having to take too much away. Um, I also like that they downsized the massive bobblehead uh, that is usually adorned by the Spartans. So uh, Master Chief... Uh, and his, I believe he's got two of these icons figures, uh, has the, the oversized helmeted head. And actually our very first icons with the red and blue Spartan kind of had that oversized Spartan head. Um, I'm glad to see for Sergeant Johnson, they've kind of scaled that down just a little bit more. Um, and, <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, poor Edward Big Head Buck did not get this treatment uh, from one of the first loot crates. But... Um, uh, I, I, I would hope that a lot of the criticism about the Buck figure uh, directly resulted in some adjustments made for Sergeant Johnson. So with that, how do I rank our Icons figure for this month? On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being, hey, this box is unopened and has so much dust on it, to a 10 being, why is this the only thing on your desk that is dusted? I give this one a solid eight. And this one is going to work with me on Monday. Sergeant Johnson will be uh, looking over my work that I do uh, at the office. So uh, well done uh, by the icons guys uh, for this Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Johnson icons figure. All right, guys, next up is what I call... Uh, the daily use item. So in all the loot crates, we have something that is meant for you to use on a daily basis uh, whilst being able to show off your Halo fandom. So in the very first loot crate, you had the, the backpack, the, the small uh, backpack. Uh, in Memories of Reach, you had the Dr. Halsey, uh, if you touch this, you'll lose an arm water bottle. Um, in this one, uh, we've got the <clears throat> i heart tanks mug and in the picture on the stream it is a full black mug and i'm actually going to hold it up right here it is a fully black mug but the picture that i took that i that i've got up has it brown and that's just a reflection from the the paper when i took the picture but it is a black mug a nice black coffee mug on the side is the standard eye, a picture of a heart, and instead of something like New York or something like that that you would see, we have a picture of a scorpion tank, not unlike the one Sergeant Johnson delivered to the Master Chief just outside of New Mombasa on the Halo 2 mission Metropolis. So you can fill this with your favorite beverage and reminisce on how you beat the bridge on Legendary with your friends. Um... So here you go. And actually it's this way, which is weird because like in order for me to display it out so that people can see it means I have to hold it with my left hand and I'm right handed. Like I'd rather hold a mug like this, my right hand. But if I do that, it's just a plain black mug. So I need to learn to be ambidextrous, I guess, unless it's just meant for me. So then I can see it. But, you know, hey. Uncle Toxie in the stream says the mug is his favorite thing from the box this time around. Thanks for dropping in the stream, Toxie. Um, okay. So for my opinion on it, for all the daily use items, the thing I look at most is quality of the product. If I'm going to be using this thing on a daily basis, it needs to hold up. The iHeart Tank image kind of feels like a sticker and like as, as i kind of tilt it in the light and you guys aren't going to be able to see this but like as i tilt it you can see the edges so it's on top of the lacquer finish to the mug um so with that something that could be it's something that i feel could be worn away quite quickly 
from daily use and daily washing. I don't recommend putting this into your dishwasher um, or else risk coming back with a just simple plain black mug minus your iHeart 4 tanks. It's also rather small. Um, I do believe it's about a 12 ounce mug. Um, <laughs> Uncle Toxie's uh, recommendation is hand wash only Spartans for your mug. I do believe it's only 12 ounces. I tried to get a full 16 ounce uh, adult beverage in here and I couldn't. Um, so I think it's only about 12 ounces. So it's kind of small. Whereas the previous mug, the plasma grenade mug, which I also have right here, uh, our plasma grenade mug, see, look at that. I'll hold them up just to kind of compare. The plasma grenade one's a little more squat, um, but it's a little bit bigger round wise. So I think you can get, I think I can almost get a full 20 ounce drink into the plasma grenade, unlike the iHeart mugs. Or I heart, I heart mugs, I heart tanks. Um, so with the quality being suspect and rather small capacity, oh, where do I rank this mug? On a scale of one to 10, with one being, hey, I think this quote broke during our last move, to a 10 of you break this while moving and you will die. Uh, I give this one a four. So almost halfway. Um, I'm really, really suspect about the quality of this one. And as I've learned with drinkware, with stuff attached to it, uh, the Halsey water bottle, for instance, these don't last very long. I actually, on my Halsey mug, uh, the ink on it, we actually put a clear nail polish over the ink to preserve it because it was already starting to come off. And it wasn't coming off from washing. It was coming off like it, from just holding it. And like I would have ink all over my hands and you can see thumbprints and stuff actually in the ink on the water bottle. So um, I think their, their quality control on their daily use item needs to go up a little bit, especially if it's going to be intended for daily use. So there you go. Up next is a staple of the Halo Loot Crates. We've been getting these ever since Loot Crate number one. And that is our collectible pin. This uh, month's Loot Crate, uh, we actually received the first Covenant weapon of this series. Uh, again, a bit odd considering the theme of the crate, but we get ourselves the Brute Shot. And some lucky Loot Craters would have received the gold version. Apparently, I run out of luck with all my gold pins because I was getting every other pin in series number one was the gold version. Uh, in series two, I got the assault rifle out of the first crate was gold and all the rest have been the silver or pewter uh, style pins. So that was what you were going to get, either gold or pewter. But actually for this one, I'm kind of glad I got the silver one out of this one. Um, these pins have some really amazing detail to them. Uh, and I've actually far more enjoyed the uh, weapons of Series 2 than I did the game metal pins from Series 1. Michael Sko in the Twitch chat. What's going on, man? How you doing? <clears throat> so let's take a little bit closer look at the Brute Shot. Uh, again, from our friends over at Halopedia, the Type 25 and Type 25B grenade launchers, aka the Brute Shots, they are belt-fed grenade launchers uh, of either four grenades that are primed on impact, which allows them to bounce off angled services, um, or uh, like the Type 25B are self-propelled grenades that detonate on impact or explode within three seconds of being fired. And that is a new follow over on Twitch, Michael Scoo. Thank you for the follow, man. Welcome to the Tasmaniacs and the Bad at Halo show. <clears throat> the large metal blade along the bottom when swung can deplete full Spartan shields on one impact. The brute shots were manufactured by the Covenant at the Sacred Promissory a munitions factory in the lower districts of high charity. The brutes are the only members of the covenant 
to wield the weapon. So there is some uh, Halo history on the Brute Shot. So where do I rank this month's Halo-themed pin? Well, see, here's the deal. Uh, like other items in this crate, I don't feel like it quite belongs in this one. But uh, it stays in line with the general Halo 2 theme. And Sergeant, Sergeant Johnson's shotgun was already taken when they used it for the quarantine zone uh, loot crate. Um, so I guess if you're going to take something that is distinctive from Halo 2, a brute shot kind of fits the bill there. Um, the problem with the pins is that I generally don't particularly care for them, period. Um, not really sure what to do with them. Uh, I kind of put them in the displays with the artwork if I can. Um, otherwise, the pins for me are always kind of take them or leave them. Don't really care too much about it. Um, so where do I rank this? Um, and I'm not even going to try to put together a cute little one to 10, one being what something and 10 being the other, uh, on a scale of one to 10, I'm just going to give it a three. Like I do most of the pins really the, the pins are take it or leave it for me. So that would be that. Now let's take a look at our data drop for this, uh, this month's loot crate. So we have ourselves some secret lore uh, for those of you from uh, those of you Spartans for Fire Team Apollo. And this one's a little bit interesting in that uh, we get an image of what we are told is a Sergeant Johnson and the Master Chief. Uh, the image is actually from or well is supposed to take place during the events of the book Operation First Strike. So those of you guys who are familiar with some of the Halo books of the past will recognize that. Um, <clears throat> the image that we're given is an image of Sergeant Johnson the Chief aboard the Covenant ship Ascendant Justice as, documented, uh, as documented from the helmet cam of Petty Officer Second Class Sheila Pulaski. And so those of you who have read First Strike, it kind of, sort of, explains how Sergeant Johnson survived the destruction of Installation 04. Uh, and, and we also had a few other survivors in there as well. So I won't, uh, won't spoil that too much for you guys that haven't read it yet. And then, of course, with the image, we get a transcript of an interview, kind of a debriefing that was done. Uh, of, or, uh, of Sergeant Johnson from Dr. Veronica Clayton aboard Cairo Station. So this would have taken place right before Halo 2. And so um, it says here in the, uh, in the message uh, from our Oni uh, assistant that is getting us all of these transmissions for Series 2, um, that uh, the doctor, Dr. Veronica Clayton, an internal investigator employed by Captain Damien Hogarth of Naval Intelligence. Uh, Hogarth worked closely with Colonel James Ackerson before his death and received approval from the Security Council to conduct full psych evaluations on the returning Spartan 2s to ensure their stability of the program, and they actually lumped Sergeant Johnson in with these interviews. Uh, the, uh, and also says that the uh, doctor that was doing the interview did not survive uh, the invasion of Cairo Station. Her pelican was actually destroyed trying to escape and head back to Earth. So unfortunate for Dr. Clayton, but uh, fortunately we get this little bit of a transcript. I'm not going to go through the transcript uh, word for word. I will tell you. We're not really told anything. It's really, it's, it's honestly, it's very much nothing. It's very much just Sergeant Johnson deflecting direct questions about the Spartan twos, their operability. They do ask specifically about Cortana and Cortana's interaction with a covenant AI aboard Ascendant Justice, which he doesn't really have any information for them to know and actually directs them to question Spartan 117 about that 
uh, instead of himself. So, honestly, this is a whole lot of nothing. Um, other than, you know, you can kind of read it in your mind, in Sergeant Johnson's voice, and maybe kind of have a chuckle um, that he's kind of giving them the runaround. Um, overall, and I'm going to take a quick look here because... Um, I don't think that I added everything up as far as what we're looking at for this loot crate overall. And you know what? I'll go ahead and I'll write these down as I go through them and review them. So for the shirt, we gave that a rating of a 2. The socks, the odd socks, the Arbiter socks, we gave that a 7. Or I guess I, not we. Um, the poster was an awesome nine. The icons figure was an eight. The I heart mugs, or I heart, I heart mugs. The I heart tanks mug. I heart mugs. I, I feel like I should make that as like a bad at Halo show purchasable item. I Heart Tank's mug was a four. The Brute Shot pin is a three. And the honestly, out of out, out of a scale of one to ten, just because of the tie-in to the the book Operation First Strike for the image, I'm gonna give this a five. Otherwise, the data drop was really disappointing. So we've got 18, 19, 20, 20. 7, 8, 9, 30, 33, 38 out of a possible 70. So, well, quick math. I'm sorry I did not realize hosting a podcast would involve math. Oof. Ouch. A 54% approval rating for this crate. Which is unfortunate considering the socks, the figure, the artwork were all really, really high. The shirt, the pin, the mug, and the disappointing data drop really brought this thing down. Um, so only 54%. 38 score out of a possible 70. Ouch. Um, so overall, the loot crate could have been a lot better. Um, I really believe that the the thing that hurt it the most for me was that when you theme it as let's get tactical, a key line of dialogue, or at least a very familiar line of dialogue with Sergeant Johnson, and to really only have your icons figure and the artwork really have anything to do with Sergeant Johnson, the data drop was weak, didn't really tell us anything. Um, and then the rest of the crate, really kind of not really feeling like it should have been placed in there. I uh, really think that that hurt it. So unfortunate uh, that it comes in so low. Um, I do plan on going back and reviewing some of the other loot crates that I have. And then uh, uh, when I get to the Bad at Halo Show website up, because I am working on that, um, we'll put a little section in there where we'll, we'll actually rank all of the loot crates that we've got. So I'm uh, looking forward to doing that. Um, while this one might not have been right what we were expecting, we do have the another Loot Crate announced, and it is actually multiplayer matchmaking theme um, with an Icons figure of a Spartan in Athlon armor, white Athlon armor with the HCS logos on it. So um, we're going to have something multiplayer matchmaking themed for our next round of Loot Crates. And I think that alone for me is enough to go ahead and give this one a try. And hopefully we get a nice little bounce back from this crate. So with that, guys, let's go ahead and let's do... Where are we at on time? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, let's go right into my running riot then for this week. Running Riot. All right. 
of the running riot makes its return this week all right let's roll on this past week former halo pro and current twitch sensation ninja broke the internet when he was asked by and streamed games of Fortnite with singer slash rapper drake travis scott and nfl player juju smith schuster as a result, Ninja broke the record for concurrent Twitch viewers on a channel with over 500,000, blowing away Dr. Disrespect's record of around, I think it was 84,000. So 500,000 people watching the squad play the hottest game out right now. This was a boon for streamers as it collided with pop culture, moving game streaming closer to the mainstream. Ninja is no overnight Twitch sensation as he has been grinding on his channel for seven years to get where he is. As it would be expected, Ninja's history with Halo came up on the internet amongst the Halo community and how it was unfortunate that Ninja had to move away from the game that got him his start to get to where he is today. This also started a string of what I feel are very dangerous conversations in what direction Halo's future should take based on the popularity of a single streamer. I'll paraphrase Duquesne 23's post on Twitter because I don't have a copy of it up, but in discussing uh, in his tweet and kind of discussing that 343 should look at Ninja's popularity and make their next game with classic gameplay so that Ninja would stream it more and it would help Halo's need to climb back into the gaming picture. Apparently Ninja has said that he would stream Halo more if it was more of a classic feel, which I find somewhat ironic as Ninja's biggest success as a Halo Pro came during his run with Halo 4. The post itself was mostly in jest, but I've seen other posts without the quote LOL indication of a joke stating much the same thing, that the population of a single streamer, or the popularity of a single streamer, would be enough to quote save Halo. In my opinion, this would be a horrifically short-sighted move on the part of 343 to follow with this line of thinking. The world of streaming is very fickle, with the top streamers coming and going depending on what the current game is and how well they play that game. Not that long ago, Dr. Disrespect was pulling in large numbers playing H1Z1 and Players Unknown Battlegrounds. Now the 2017 Streamer of the Year, as of March of 2018, is having difficulty bringing in the top numbers in his attempts to switch to Fortnite, but not nearly as successful at the game as Ninja. In other words, trends in streamers are as unstable, if not more so, than trends in games, and to steer an entire gaming franchise towards the preference of a single person because they are currently the hot commodity would absolutely blow up in the developer's face. What if Ninja is no longer pulling down the top numbers by the time the game is out? What if he doesn't like the game and is either doesn't stream it or only streams it until the next new game comes out, publicly bashes the new title on his stream to his millions of subscribers as a rather risky gamble based on the likes of one person? Which is why something like the Halo Community Feedback Program is sorely needed and why if you aren't a part of it yet, you should be. This program collects data, opinions, and suggestions from the community that is far more comprehensive than the likes and desires of a single person that is more interested in making sure he's on top of the current trend than necessarily playing the game that he likes. This type of program and the results in it is one of the factors that will be part of the decision-making process for the franchise and a far better indicator of where the game should go. So while Ninja could most certainly help a game that is tailored more to his liking, I think we would be far greater served by catering a game to a larger audience Make a game enjoyable and fun, and not worry so much about who's streaming it, or how many are streaming it, etc, etc. Just make the game that people want, and the people will follow.
All right, guys. There was one thing that I forgot to do during my Loot Crate review. And that is on the back of the artwork, they always show everything that you got with Loot Crate. And they always give you a free gold rec pack. Well, you see, here's the thing. I've got everything unlocked. I don't need gold rec packs. But you know what? Some of you guys out there, you might. So how about this? There's the 5x5 five five code on the screen right now for anybody that's watching on Twitch, Mixer, or YouTube. It's not used. I haven't used it. So first one that goes in, enters that 5x5 five five code, you can go ahead. You can get yourself that gold rec pack. And just like that, it's gone. All right. I want to get in my last shot right here. I want to thank all of you guys for taking time out of your day to drop by the stream on Mixer. We do broadcast live every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Mixer, Twitch, YouTube, Hasman Live is what you're looking for. Uh, we also do the uh, gameplay streams on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So uh, this Tuesday, Thursday, we'll probably be getting in some more of the Halo 3 throwback playlist so I can get uh, that in before they take it away for something else. Um, I didn't have time today to go over my uh, assault rifle in the throwback list analysis, so I'll actually be able to get a few more games in and uh, get some more data, and we'll go over, is the assault rifle as overpowered in that list as people complain about? And I think you guys will be surprised what the results are there. For those of you guys that can't watch live, of course, we do have the Bad at Halo Show podcast, so it's the audio version only of today's broadcast, and that is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and whatever your favorite podcast catching app is. It's out there. It's available. You can get it. Go ahead, get it, subscribe, and you will get a new episode of the Bad at Halo Show every Monday morning uh, for you to listen on as you're driving to work, maybe listen to it while you're at work, uh, on your way home from work. If you're trying to avoid listening to the wife, getting you to do your honey-do list, whatever. Use it as a distraction in any way that you guys absolutely need. All that I ask is that you leave a rating and a review uh, just to try to direct more people to the show. Uh, you can follow us on our very various social media. Most of it has been scrawling here along the bottom of the stream for you, but we are at Bad Halo Show on Twitter, Bad Halo Show on Facebook, and then also uh, the Bad at Halo Show, or excuse me, Bad Halo Show uh, up until I get the website up and running. So that should be coming up soon. And then of course we also have the Bad at Halo Show Discord. There you go. There's a link to it right there for you guys that are in the chat. I'll have a link in the description for those of you guys listening on the audio version to jump in, talk with other supporters of the show. Uh, anything Halo playoff hockey is coming up so that's gonna be uh, the hockey version of the discord is probably gonna be going up here pretty soon if you guys are creating things in the community YouTube videos artwork you're working on the game and developing it we have a community created or community content section of our discord so you guys can get that stuff out there as well okay guys um I would say with that my Spartan is dead and I will catch you guys on my next respawn. Until then, guys, later. All right. What a show. Who we got left? There was a couple people ducked out there at the end. Oh, we got quite a few people still still in here. All right. I'm going to take the coat off because god damn is it hot. Oh. I got to get a fan going for this.
thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, I'm starting to make the big bucks doing the, the podcast. So, you know, they set me up in a nice, uh, nice new studio here. Digging it. Oh, I've got to write down the thing for Potacular, too. Oof. So you really like the mug, huh, Toxie? I really like those socks. Those socks are nice. Actually, actually warm yesterday. Ooh, all right. All right, guys. We got uh, we got about nine people watching between YouTube. Twitch, Mixer. I want to do a giveaway, but it looks like most of the people are on YouTube, and I can't do... I don't have a bot for YouTube. Yeah, but I'm scared to use it too much. Nah, I hear you. I totally hear you on that. I, I don't want to use it all that much either. Ooh, dang, we jumped up to 53. This must be all people from YouTube. What's up, YouTube? How you doing? Sorry you guys missed the show. It was awesome. You guys can watch it though. As soon as I hit stop record, it'll show up on the channel. You guys can watch it from the beginning. Oh man. Yeah, I definitely, I feel like I definitely need to get a bot for YouTube now. The plasma grenade cup is awkward as hell. Yeah, but you know what? And here, let me let me switch over to the. But it is, but I mean, you can. Like the 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 volume is so much more. The only thing I don't like about the plasma grenade one. Is that, it's hard to wash on the inside, like where the handles. There's these little divots where the handles meet the cup. And so it's stained. Like I've got like my, my Mio, like I, wear, I put water and then I put like that Mio stuff in there and it's stained on the inside. So I got to get like, like one of those brushes that I had like for my son's wa uh, a bottle and really get in there and get that. But I mean, I mean, it's all right. But like, I'm like you, like, I don't want to use this all that much because this, I feel like this sticker will come off super easily. Like you said, hand wash only. You were having trouble drinking from it? Well, that's because you were drunk. I mean, that's, that's just the simple, the simple answer, answer there. All right. I need to do... So I need to get a bot for YouTube because we're getting some, we're getting a lot of YouTube people in here. 73 people on YouTube. Let's do this for all you guys watching on YouTube. I want to do, I've got a billion and a half platinum rec packs to give away from uh, the Australia regional and the Latin American regional. So let's start getting some followers on, on the YouTube channel. So you guys on YouTube, hit the follow or hit the subscribe button on YouTube. And I'm going to throw everybody that subscribes here tonight into a hat. I'm going to pull three. So we'll pull three people for rec packs, platinum rec packs. You cannot buy these. You cannot grind for them. Uh, you can only get these watching the streams and getting the codes. And so I've got a bunch to give away. Time to start giving them out. So go ahead, hit the subscribe button right now. And I will pick three people out of those subscribers. So you have no reason not to. Plus, if you watch the rebroadcast of the podcast, there's a five by five code in there somewhere for a gold pack too. Whew. All right. Well, guys, I am off to bed. Thank you guys for joining me. I like this little post show thing. I think I might do this more often too. 
just as a little a little something for the people that were watching on stream so it's just something specific and exclusive to you guys so i think i'm going to do this more often but uh all right i gotta go it's getting late and uh tuesday on Tuesday, we're going to stream some Halo 3 throwback list in Halo 5. So uh, hopefully I'll see all of you guys then.